Okay, let's have a quick look at the Fuji X-T1 and I do have the Olympus EM1 over here. I did not plan on having both of these cameras at the same time. Uh, I own both of these cameras, but uh, the reason I came across the X-T1 was because I had a Nikon D600 and I just frankly got tired of the, the extra size and weight, so I decided to finally go sell my D600 and I replaced it with the Fuji X-T1 with the money that I had from the sale of that. Um, I won't really go into like, a, you know, it's not really a review of the camera because a lot of people have done that already. Um, I, you know, I may mention a few things about the features and functions, but uh, this is more or less, you know, uh, my thoughts on the usage. and. Um, more or less a comparison to the EM1 if we want to do that because I know a lot of people have asked questions about you know should I get the EM1 or should I get the Fuji X-T1 um, obviously the Fuji X-T1 has a larger sensor the APS-C size sensor versus the four-third sensor in the Olympus EM1 and um, you know that's really only going to make a difference in the depth of field the EM1 would have a naturally deeper depth of field and the EM1 would actually have a little less image quality you know lower quality on the very high ISO settings although it's very good for what it is I mean it's it's not um, it, it's not a full frame quality it's not um, up to the the very highest uh, quality APS-C size sensors as far as a high ISO goes uh, but it but it is very very good and um, if I only had the EM1 I'd be totally happy with it um, because it is very good and the uh, the high ISO the grain that's in the pictures it's really not objectionable at all and um, it's just really nothing to worry about I mean if you if you're just comparing the EM1 to the XT1 for those purposes just the high ISO quality I, you know, yes, the XT1 is is better at that, and it's noticeably better, um, but it's not enough, you know, to be a deal breaker to me. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so of course the XT1 has all the dials on the top. You know, you've got the exposure compensation, uh, shutter speed, which you have to press down the center button and then turn, and once you unlock it, then you've got the set, set your set, shutter speed without having to press the button. The ISO on the other hand um, you do have to press and hold that to change it to any other setting but um, so if you set it on 400 for example you can't change it until you press the button again. Uh, one thing to note <coughs> excuse me, on the ISO um, oh what is that there's a something related to the auto ISO I'll uh, maybe come back to that, but there was, I remember something going on with the, uh, the auto ISO. There's something you have to have the auto, auto ISO off for, and I can't remember. <laughs> it escapes me at the moment, but um, anyway, the electronic viewfinder that people were raving about, it actually is really that good. Um, I wear glasses, so it, unfortunately I can't, like, press my eye way up all the way so that, uh, you know, my face is uh, covering this, you know, the rubber cup there, but um, I, I can get my glasses pretty much right up against this and see, uh, you know, the, the whole view, and it is a very, very large viewfinder when you look into there. Um, the, uh, you know, the display is, like they said, it's very crisp, clean, and, and uh, the refresh rate, you know, is very fast. I mean, you can move it around really fast, and, and it's not like uh, any kind of jello effect when you're moving it, and it's not laggy. Um, so it is really good. And, of course, like the EM-1, now the, uh, the X-T1 has uh, the tilting LCD panel. It's not touchscreen, which uh, is okay, but I, I do like to use the touchscreen on the EM1 for selecting focus. You know, you just uh, touch where you want to focus and that's where you'll be taking your pictures. <clears throat> on the side, you know, you've got your microphone, uh, HDMI and USB output, and the memory card is on the side, which is really nice because you can just 
you can get to that without having to worry about a tripod plate being in the way. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there, somebody, a lot of people mentioned the buttons. I don't know if you can see this. Um, these, the four-way controller, these buttons here, they're a little bit too far recessed, I think. <clears throat> I think the whole video will be clearing my throat. Um, and they are, they're a little bit hard to press, you know, when you're, when you're not looking at the camera, if you're, if you're not deliberately pressing your kind of like thumbnail right down on the, the buttons, they're not always really easy to reach or activate, uh, not reach, but they're not always easy to activate. So I took a, a few layers, I layered up a few pieces of, uh, gaffer's tape, which has, you know, pretty safe adhesive on it. It comes off real easy and, and doesn't leave a lot of, you know, residue or anything. Uh, so it should be totally safe. But I, I took a few layers of that and kind of cut it out as best I could and uh, put that right on there. I don't know if you can see that. So, you know, they stick out a little bit now and I can, it's really easy to press them. And, and you would use that to change, like, the focus point, uh, navigate through some of the menus and so on. So you, you may not be constantly using those buttons. It you know may be a little bit of an issue for you, may not be. But um, I don't know. <clears throat> I may take the tape off. I'm not really sure. Um, I, I do like it much better how it feels now, but I'm always a little paranoid, even though it should be totally safe with the gaffer's tape. Um, I'm always a little paranoid about putting anything on my cameras because I don't want anything uh, to happen, you know, to damage it permanently. And, because eventually I'll have to resell it, and I want it to look as you know good as possible when I sell it. Um, focusing speed is you know it is very quick compared to I had an X Pro One in the past with the 35 millimeter, but admittedly that's one of the slower lenses. Um, so the lens itself, that 35 millimeter f1.4 lens, was probably part of the reason why it was a little slow focusing on the X Pro One. But uh, but the 18 to 55 that comes with the XT1, uh, you can get it with a kit. You don't have to, but um, you know it's a very versatile range. I guess it's somewhere in the 27 to 80 something uh, range equivalent for full frame. It does have image stabilization built in. The little switch here, and um, <clears throat> actually that's where the aperture uh, OIS optical image stabilization is down here. Um, you know, I would say the IS the image stabilization is not as good as what it is on the EM1, but you know, it seems to be pretty effective, like just any other image stabilized image stabilized lens. If I could talk, um, you know, like on the Nikon cameras, anything that I've used similar to that. Um, you know, <clears throat> as far as focusing speed, it is pretty quick. You know, I wouldn't say it's as fast as the EM1, uh, but there's no reason at all why. I think anybody that's not doing anything short of sports and things like that would have any complaints about it. You know, it's 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 very quick and uh, very accurate. <clears throat> um, <laughs> you know, there, it is nice that you do have access to the metering mode. If you look down here below the dial, uh, there's actually a little switch in the front. When you you can change that just by flipping the switch there. Kind of the same thing for the, you know, the drive mode, you know, single shot, uh, continuous high, or low, continuous high, bracketing. I normally shoot single. I, I don't usually do continuous high, continuous low. Um, subjects that I shoot, I'm usually just kind of a one-shot, you know, type of person. Um, as far as how the body feels... It feels good in my hand, and it's obviously well built. Um, but compared to the EM1, and I, and this kind of surprised me after I got the XT1, this grip on the EM1. I like it because you can, when you put your hand around it, your middle finger kind of goes underneath this part right here, and it's just a really secure way to hold the camera. I mean, whether you're holding it down because the grip is kind of deep. I know, <clears throat> I know some people may not like that deep grip, and you know, maybe they don't like exactly how it looks, but, but I'm telling you, this is probably, <clears throat> sorry, the best feeling body, camera body, 
that I've ever felt in my hands. I mean, it's, um, I know there's an XT1 video, but I know a lot of people interested in thoughts between the EM1 and the XT1, so that's why I'm talking about this. Um, the two control dials, you know, for like the front and the back, like normally this would be exposure compensation. I mean, it's just absolutely perfectly placed. When you have the camera in your hand, you know, the shutter button is right there too, so you just move your finger down, instantly you're changing exposure compensation. And on the back, it's sort of the same thing, you know, you've got your thumb here naturally, and, and guess what, and you know, right there's the the uh, command dial, and so that would be like if you're in aperture priority, you'd be changing aperture, you know, if you're in shutter priority, you'd be changing your shutter speed, and of course the dial is either lockable or unlockable, so it's, it's like a toggled switch, you can unlock it or keep it locked, whatever you prefer, and um, I really like that, I, I miss, maybe the uh, buttons on the, the X-T1 were like that. Um, you know, the viewfinder on the EM1 is <clears throat> a little bit smaller, but it's really a nice EVF, uh, excellent EVF. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities about the EM1 compared to the XT1. Of course, you got your the uh, dial or the door over here for the memory card, just like on the XT1. The uh, LCD panel is pretty much. It's kind of exactly the same, you know, it does the same thing, flips out the same way. Um, so really, I think between these two cameras, it's, yes, there is an image quality difference, um, but I would say, honestly, it's probably a fairly small difference compared to um, you know, the X-T1. You know, there is just a tiny bit of grain in the, even in the lower ISO photos on the EM1. Um, you know, again, this is something that nobody would ever really see if you're viewing pictures normally. Everybody gets obsessed with viewing pictures at 100%. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of unfortunate because everybody ends up just uh, arguing about the very best image quality and who's got the best pixels. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a little silly, really, but um, Obviously, there is a difference between the EM1 and the XT1 with image quality, and I've been very impressed with the XT1. The uh, every, everything that should be clean is is super clean, and the uh, out of focus areas are super clean. I mean, there's absolutely no noise at all in the lower ISOs, and even way up into the high ISOs, you'd be hard pressed to to find real grain. Um, so the backgrounds, you know, smooth as silk out of focus and the areas that are in focus are very sharp and very crisp uh, and this lens by the way the 1855 that's not a cheap kit lens that's if you were to buy that separately it's a $700 lens and um, the image quality on that it, it's excellent it's a f2.8 to f4 so it's a variable aperture um, but it's better than you know the 5.6 or 6.3 you get from the other kit lenses <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, the, the uh, XT1 compared with the 18-55 gave really, really good image quality. Um, you know, this, like I said, this lens, if you want to call it a kit lens, it's not really a kit lens, but like compared to the other ones, Nikon, Canon, and so on, um, it's it's very impressive. So, what I well, I guess let me talk about what I do with the buttons. So you can customize these function buttons. These four on the back are totally customizable. Um, you can customize what is normally the Wi-Fi button. Uh, I left it for Wi-Fi because that's convenient. And the Wi-Fi app is really nice, actually. You can control the camera. You can take pictures with it. You can change uh, various modes. Um, you can transfer the pictures. Um, <clears throat> I believe you can actually change the uh, aperture and so on. I'd had to fire it up and look at it, but I can't remember. But it, but it's a, it's just as full featured as any other app, and maybe more so. Uh, there's a dedicated record button for video, which you can't change. And then this button on the front, uh, there's a little function button here. And actually, what I use this for, since it's really easy to get to, I'll I'll use that for the uh, uh, focusing mode. So maybe I don't know if you can see that, but I 
I just press it and you can actually use the front command dial to, to make your change uh, between multi-area or <clears throat> you know the multi-point which is it selects the area on its own or the uh, area which is where you actually select the focus point and uh, that brings me to the back button I have just like on my X100S uh, since that button is selects a focus point on the top so the top button here I have set to move around the focus point and uh, let's see what I have aside the left I have set for face detection on and off because it does have a well working face detection um, but if you're using face detection you have to be in the multi area mode for focusing um, it wants to be able to focus wherever it wants to focus um, and then, when, then you can turn on the face detection um, the one on the button on the right I have it for self timer and the button on the left macro which I don't really know that I'd ever use I'm not even really sure that it's <clears throat> I, I guess it does something with the the lenses but um, macro mode that's normally you know for what I would think is a function for fixed lens cameras but uh, it does seem to change it to where you can focus a little bit closer with the 18-55 I haven't really played around with it much so I'm not really can't really talk about that too much um, this strap in case you've noticed it I um, can't remember the exact model number but it is a Tamrac and uh, if you go to their website or search on Amazon for Tamrac mirrorless strap um, this is kind of what you find it's got a little sliding leather pad here which is nice and uh, I liked it so much I bought one for the M1 and for the uh, <clears throat> XT1 the um, the top part it's not like where you normally have like a big long piece of uh, material that kind of loops through the, the hook at the bottom and then you run it through some other fasteners and then secure it uh, just got a little piece of velcro to keep that from separating uh, just because I don't like it to separate uh, but this is permanently attached right here and this is permanently attached to this part so the way you fasten this is you take the this one little piece right here is able to kind of un come out of these fasteners and you loop it through and then you go through the first one and then the second one and that's never going to come off um, I like the width it's about uh, was it about an inch maybe so I think it's a very comfortable strap and very appropriate for this type of camera. And uh, while I'm at it, you know, the batteries are on the bottom. Um, I ask people about these these uh, Watson batteries that uh, you can find on the website on, on the internet. Um, I think B&H Photo is where I got these. Um, but the uh, Fuji batteries uh, was it the WP. Uh, NPW 126 uh, they're at $50 these are about $24 and I asked people that bought them on B&H because there's quite a few people that bought them um, actually I read the reviews on B&H photo and uh, nobody was really complaining about them everybody had really good things to say about it and I also asked on more discussion forums and um, everybody had good things to say about it so normally I'm a little leery about buying batteries but since they were hard to find the original batteries plus they're fifty dollars a piece uh, and not really in stock much um, right now I went ahead and bought the two of the Watson batteries and I bought this the uh, dual charger you know it's got a display that shows you the status of each battery and the thing is this charger can charge two different batteries I've got you know one a plate for the Fuji these little plates come out and you can buy different plates for all the different kinds of batteries so I've got one for my Fuji, one for my Olympus and you can actually charge the different batteries at the same time uh, or you can get two of the Fuji plates, put them in there and charge two Fuji batteries at the same time um, and it also has a little USB outlet here so you can like, charge your phone or tablet, whatever you want to do um, and it even comes with a uh, adapter for uh, it would plug in right there for the uh, car so if you want to use this in your car, charge your batteries on the trip you can do that too. It's a little bit big and bulky maybe for a trip but this is something I would probably stick in my suitcase um, I wouldn't really carry this around my camera bag so 
I think the size is okay. It, I wish it was a little bit smaller, but still. Anyway, um, I think that's probably all I'm going to say about these two cameras. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, I really love the body on the EM1. I'd probably like that more than the XT1, but uh, you know, the XT1, I'm very impressed with it and very happy with it. The image quality and you know, the images in general are great. At this point, uh, Adobe Lightroom does not support raw files out of the XT1. I think it will very soon. And it also should support all the color profiles, like the Vivid, uh, not Vivid, what do they call it? Um, Velvia, and uh, you know all the like Provia, Astia, all the the color modes that's in the uh, XT1. Those have been emulated now in some profiles that Adobe will have for Lightroom, and uh, that should be out fairly soon. I'm really looking forward to that because I always shoot in RAW, so right now I'm just shooting in JPEG. Um, and I believe they've also improved the raw processing. I know some people have complained about, um, you know, the, the quality of the raw conversions with Adobe. But <clears throat> apparently they're working with Fuji now, so that should be improved. And I, uh, frankly, I was I was happy with the way it was before, but I'll be even more happy with it now, especially because you have the color profiles. Um, and uh, they already have them for Adobe for the Olympus. Um, so, like in the Raw files for the M1 in Adobe Lightroom. You can select, you know, go down at the bottom of where it says Camera Calibration in the Develop Menu or Develop Mode module, and uh, select things like Vivid, um, Standard, or whatever the whatever the whatever the color profiles are. I can't remember exactly, but you probably already know what I'm talking about if if you use Lightroom. Um, so that's it. Uh, you know, I like I said, I didn't really plan on having both of these cameras. And um, I think it would be hard for me to sell one of them and, and feel really comfortable, so I'm probably just going to keep both. Uh, but I probably need to decide which one I'm going to start uh, buying lenses for. And uh, I know there's an 18-135 to weather sealed lens coming for the X-T1, and that's probably the next lens I want to get because the 12-40, to which is a 24-80 to equivalent on the EM1, that's f2.8 lens, constant aperture. Um, yeah, it's an excellent lens, and it's very versatile. And um, I don't think I want to buy another Olympus lens yet. Uh, I think I'm going to fill out the XT1 first and uh, kind of go that direction. So I think that's it for now, and uh, hopefully you didn't mind my clearing of the throat too much and my babbling on because I tend not to be very articulate. But thanks for watching.